But as I start off today, I want to ask you this question, and I almost asked my wife to stay up here for just a second, although she would have killed me for that. But I wanted to ask this. Um, how many guys, whether you're married or not, you, you can be just like I dated somebody, maybe you used to have a spouse or whatever, um, uh, for whatever reason, or you have one now. How many of you guys would say this? My spouse or my, my boyfriend, girlfriend, my fiance, they are the opposite of me. My wife should be raising her hand right now. Raise your hand real high. I can't believe she wasn't like, like real proud of that one. Um, yeah, because my wife and I, we are a lot of opposites in a lot of ways. In fact, uh, we, we really, a lot, a lot of times when we're talking to each other, we're talking about these opposites. Because um, like I'm hot and she's cold a lot of times. And um, uh, I mean, there, there are so many different things about how we are different and, and how we raise different. Of course, she's from Florida and I'm not. And so uh, that just explains a lot of things there. Um, but uh, those people from Florida, yeah, I don't know about them. But anyway, we'll, we'll stop there. Um, but opposites. And you know, uh, when you start dating somebody, and I don't know if you, you probably could finish this one for me, we have this statement that we say. We say that opposites attract. Yeah, you guys got that one, right? Opposites attract. But when we get married, you know what the statement becomes? This is how it goes. Opposites attract until you get married, and then opposites... No, 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 no. You're close. You're close. Opposites, opposites attract when we're dating, but opposites attack. Yes. Did you hear it? Yes. I was serious about this. I'm not just trying to be funny because that's what we're going to talk about today. Opposites attack when we get married. And that's the, the issue today because of the differences we have, because we are opposites. There are so many differences. Uh, for instance, you know, to me, meat and potatoes are the most important part of the meal in my wife. It's the dessert. It's all about the sweet part of it. And, and that's just one of those opposite things that, that happens in our life, and that's a good thing because God made us different. In fact, I think one of the things that I noticed in Christianity as I grew up is how many times Christians tried to make everybody the same, and that's not how God designed us to be. We are different. Just look around you. And in fact, look at the person next to you today. Uh, and if you don't have somebody directly next to you, look at the person in front of you or behind you and say, you are so different. Yeah, you are. You are. That's true. You are so different. Johnny's like, yeah, I got this one easy. Yeah. Uh, he looked over at Lisa and said, you are so different. So it's exactly it. We are different, and that's not a bad thing. But here's the problem with, with marriage and relationships. Satan comes along, and he tells us that those differences are bad. In fact, he uses the differences Satan does, and, and he does it not just in relationships like marriage, but he does this in the church. Satan uses our differences to divide. I'm serious. As anything, Satan says, hey, we should all be the same. We should all. That's not God's plan for us. 
God's plan is for us to be unified, but not all the same. And that's a good thing, because man, man, if everybody was like me, you guys would be in trouble, and I know that. But Satan says, hey, you know what? Your differences are the bad thing, and especially in marriage. He does that in marriage relationships. And you know what God's plan is? God's plan is to, to take these differences that you have in your marriage, to take all the differences that we find in each other, and use them to strengthen the marriage. Did you know that? That's the great thing. And yet, so many times, you know what marriages do? They fight, they fight, they attack, because opposites attack when we're married. Instead of, and, and yet, we forget, opposites attracted us in the dating days. And that's what we're going to talk about today. And the reason I want to talk about this is because uh, this vow of partnership, and that's what we're going to talk about today, the vow of partnership is so important to help us have healthy marriages and healthy marriages that last a long time. Now, in week one, we started off talking about the, the, the vow of priority, if you weren't here. And you can always go onto our website and look on the sermons and, and catch up on all the ones that we, uh, we've done before. But in week one, we said the vow was, vow number one, and, and I want you to read it with me in case you forgot what it was. So everybody out loud, I promise. that. Come on, that's weak. That is so weak. You guys are so much louder than this. Here we go. I promise that God will be my one and my spouse will be my two. Now that means, hey, God's my first priority, my spouse is my second. And that's so blow, mind-blowing. And if you're not a Christ follower, you may have difficulty with this. Even Christ followers have difficulty with this. Because we're like, well, no, 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 spouse is supposed to be one. No, no, that's not really what God wanted. God wants to be first, and he has to be first. No other gods before him, right? And sometimes we make our spouse our God, and that's where marriages fail. Because our spouse isn't designed to be our God. They aren't designed to be our savior. They can't save us from all the problems that come. Only one can do that, and that's God. And that's why the vow of priority is so important. And that doesn't mean our spouse isn't important. It just means we have to have the right priorities how we go through. And then week two, last week, we had the vow of pursuit. Right. I was, uh, you guys pay attention. That's good. The vow of pursuit. And the vow said, and everybody read this with me. I promise I will always pursue my two. Because remember, <laughs> we pursue what we don't have. And so when we get married, we just stop pursuing and the love goes away. And, you know, I'm all by myself and we don't want to do this thing. And so we've, our marriages fail apart. So we make that vow that God said. Remember, we saw that in Genesis chapter chapter 2 where it said that uh, they were, they were going to pursue hard against each other. And this week, we're going to talk about something a little bit different. But we're still in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, as our launching point. And that's where we've been every week of this series. And so last week, we, we, we focused on that word united. Today, we're going to focus a little bit differently on it. So it says there in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, that is why. Now, remember the background to this. I want to give you the background because we read this in the first week. But I, this week, we're just going to stick to this one verse. God has gone through and, and in seven days created all there is. And he's got man there, Adam. And he brings all the animals and insects to, uh, to Adam. Uh, have you ever thought about that too? He had, uh, God gave Adam a job to name all the animals. And so, man, I think some of the first animals he saw were things like hippopotamus. Because that's a cool name, right? The platypus. By the end of the day, though, I'm pretty sure that he was getting tired so when this insect comes flying along, he looks at it and goes, fly. <laughs> I'm just tired. I can't think of anything else. I don't know. That's just how I picture it. But anyway, God is really, the reason he brought them there wasn't really to name all these animals as much as God was using them to see, uh, to show the magnificence of, of his power, but also to see what would happen, something that he already knew, to make it clear to us what his design was. And so he brings all these animals forward and Adam's like, hey, that, that do I love dogs. That dog is so cool. And, and he calls the dog a dog and, and the fly, the fly, and all these different things. But as cool as the dog is, the dog wasn't a life helper. And as cool as, well, I can't say a cat is because I don't like cats. So um, <laughs> if you're a cat lover, sorry, but we'll get over that. Um, all dogs go to heaven, all cats don't. <laughs> and I didn't use the bad word, so anyway. That's bad theology, I know, but that's how I, 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 I know. But moving on. The, the bad line is we understand that as, as Adam had all these animals there, the Bible clearly says that there was no helper, no equal. 
no equal. And I want to, uh, this is sort of a side note um, to help you with this. That helper, that equal, and I want to make sure we're clear on this because this is really where we're concentrating today on this, but it's not the verse I'm going to concentrate on. The animals are not man's equal. As much as I love dogs and all that, not my equal. Okay? And, and I say that, and you say, well, of course. No, no, no. The trend today is that the rights of animals are equal to the rights of, in fact, sometimes even above the rights of humans. Okay? Uh, I, we ought to treat animals with dignity and respect as God created them to, for us, but we are created to have dominion over those animals. That's what God gave the power to man to do. So they're not the equal. So when he brings all these animals to Adam, Adam looks at them, names them, but no helper, no equal was found. And certainly God is not the equal of man either, by the way. And so man, for the first time, experienced this whole condition where he was alone, and God says it's not good. The only thing he said about creation, he says it's not good that man is alone. And so what did God do? He's spoken everything else in existence. Why didn't he speak woman into existence? Well, because he wanted us to have an invested interest in this partnership. And that's really what we're looking at today. And so God puts Adam to sleep, and he reaches into him, performs the first surgery, removes a rib, and out of the rib, though he didn't have to, out of the rib, for a reason he did this, he created woman because he wanted them to be equals. He didn't want to say, well, this is your servant here. Men and women are equal. Hear me? Men and women are equal. They're not lesser men. And I want to make sure we're clear on this because we're going to talk about that word submission today a little bit. Not lesser. They're equals. The Bible teaches complementarianism. That's what it teaches. You may not like it because it's not modern trends, but that's what the Bible teaches, that man and women complement each other because he comes to this verse cer certainly after they're married or at the marriage and says, that is why, in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, that is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united, that's the word we looked at last week, to his wife, and they become one flesh. They become one flesh. It's the reason the ring, right? The ring has no beginning, no ending. The circle, that's what we talk about, and that's the symbol of this unity, and that's what we really want. In this, this, this Hebrew term here, become one, and I could give you the word, but it wouldn't mean anything to you. It means to be united, to be completely joined as one. And the idea here in the, in the original language is when you look at Adam and you look at Eve, you couldn't see where one started and the other one stopped. You saw one couple. You saw one flesh, one. And everything about them became one. See, it's their one love that's going to be able to be used to multiply mankind on the face of the earth, right? And so this one flesh had a lot more to do with just a physical intimacy. It had to do with their, their whole union. And that's the whole idea here. And this passage is so unique uh, because we, we realize even down the road, Jesus is going to quote this. But let me, before we go move on, before we say anything more, I need to address something. Uh, and I want to do this with all the dignity and, and respect I can get. <sighs> Mankind has, uh, uh, because of our choices, we've, we've lived a fallen life. The Bible tells us that, and it's something that I, I'm sure everyone in here knows, but sometimes we sort of forget that we're all sinners. And what does that mean? That means I don't care how long you've been saved. I don't care whether you're a deacon, a pastor, whether you come to church all your life, whether you hold the Bible and you've worn it out, whether you can quote the whole entire Bible or not, you are still a filthy, rotten, stinking sinner. And if we could just get a view of ourselves, in fact, it, it's, it makes me feel bad, but the closer I get to God, the more I feel bad about myself because he is so much better than I am. And that's why God is God and I'm not. So I don't stand before you today as a pastor going, look at me, I'm so great. I stand before you to go, hey, look at God. He is great. As we talked about in Sunday school, he is the good God. And good is so much of a term that we, we limit here, but God's infinitely good in every aspect. But here's the, here's the thing I need to say. I think Christianity has been insensitive, and so I want to make sure today I'm very sensitive to all the people in this room and anybody listening. One of the reasons why some people don't like to come to church is they feel judged. This is a judgment-free zone, and I mean that. God judged our sins on the cross of Calvary and paid for them. Today we're going to talk about truth, and sometimes truth hurts us. I don't know how many times I've said this. The messages I preach are for me, and they hurt me deeply. But they hurt me in such a way that draws me closer to God. 
Isaiah in Isaiah chapter 6 stood in a vision of, of God, stood in God's temple in heaven. And when he got a glimpse of the glory of God, he realized, he said these words, Woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of, of unclean lips, and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. And with that, an angel came down, went to the altar, and picked up, using tongs, picked up a coal that is burning hot, and walked over to him, and touched his mouth, touched his lips, with a burning hot coal. And you say, what, what, what? That doesn't make... Hey, you know what? He understood how, worth, how unworthy he was. And he needed, the closer he got to God, the, the more he understood how unworthy he was. And the only thing he could do was repent and have something burn it out of him. That was the symbol there. And I say this because I know there are people in this room that are hurting because they've been through relationship problems over their time. And today we're going to talk about some things that are really hard, but I've got to address the fact that there's pain and brokenness through marriages that have failed, through divorce. And for you that are here that may, or listening online that may be going through that, I, I don't quite understand it because I haven't gone through it, but I am deeply concerned about you. My heart bleeds for you. Just this last week, we had a leadership meeting here at the church, and we were talking about being better Christians at, at loving people in all their walks of life, including people that have been through the hurt of divorce because it is painful. I have family members that have gone through that and still have not gotten over it. And it is, a, it is a deep wound, and I realize that. But the other thing I must say today, and this is where I really have to beg your forgiveness for this as I deal with it, and hopefully I deal with it in a sensitive way, I do not apologize for the word of God. It is true, and we believe it and embrace it. And though you cannot go back and change your past, I also cannot void the word of God to say things that God said and make them untrue. God had some sayings that, that hurt us deeply and convicted me of my sin. And so if you're here today and you're hurting, this isn't judgment on you. This is help for all of us to make our marriages better. With that said, and, and, and I apologize that I said that, but uh, I had to say it, but I felt like we needed to address that so that I didn't offend anybody. Today, as we look in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, you realize Jesus actually quoted this verse but when he quoted it, and here's the, here's the mysterious thing about Jesus. When he quoted it, he expounded upon it. He added to it. And he said so much more that helped define it. And that's really what we want to look at. So if you have your Bibles, we're in Matthew chapter 19. In Matthew chapter 19, Jesus has faced his foes once again, the Pharisees, the religious people. And they've come to trap him. And they've asked him questions about marriage, and they've asked him really specifically about the area of divorce. And by the way, divorce in the Bible was a little different than it is in today's deal. But they asked him a question thinking this, and I want to make sure we're clear on it. They know that the practice of the first century in divorce was evil, was wrong. Men were using it at that time to control and abuse women for their own reasons. And then they were using a religious reason to say it's okay. So when they came to talk to Jesus and ask him questions about this, they posed this question about, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And when they asked that, the religious people of the day understood how evil society had been and how wrong and corrupt it was to do this practice because most of these women, when they were being used and divorced, they were being, as they, they were divorced, you were turning to a life, these women would be forced to turn to a life of poverty and or prostitution. It was. It was so much different than today's divorce. So don't think of today's divorce. I want you to think of it differently. The men came out unscathed and could do anything they wanted. It was so unfair. And they knew it was evil. But they also knew that Moses, back in the Old Testament, when he gave the law of God, had allowed, had permitted people to get writs of divorce, to separate from the wives under better circumstances, not these. But, and so they put together this trap for Jesus. And basically they were giving Jesus this option, support divorce and support evil, and we've nailed you there, or condemn the law the law of Moses, which that would automatically get him to be in trouble with the Jewish culture of that day, and they would automatically call for his stoning. So as we get to verse 5, Jesus is answering the question they had presented, and he begins with, with and, and he answers a question with a question, and he says this, for this reason, 
A man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. And that's part of his question there, but it's the quote of Genesis 2.24. And then, in case we weren't sure, he adds verse 6 so that we can really understand what he's trying to say here, and this is where we want to camp today. And he says this, so they, that is the man and the wife, so they are no longer two, but one flesh. Isn't that what we, we looked at just a minute ago in Genesis 2? They are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, conclusion being drawn here, therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. There should be no beginning, no ending. And, and we look at this and go, oh, yeah, yeah, and we quote it. I don't know how many times I've heard it quoted, and I've quoted it at weddings I've done, and it's good, but do we really understand what it's talking about here? See, today as we look into this, what we have to understand is God is trying to help us redefine what marriage is, and he realized by the first century that marriage had really gotten out of whack. This divorce thing had gotten out of hand. And, and he's sitting back going, hey, this isn't what God intended. He doesn't want two individuals. He wants one. He wants unity so much that we have this whole loving relationship. And really, when you get down to it in Ephesians chapter 5, isn't that what Paul's teaching? When he says, hey, Jesus Christ and, and the church, the church's bride, they're to be so, so close to each other that they're not two separate things, but one. See, when people outside of our walls look at Maple Springs Baptist Church, they're not supposed to see Tracy Marsh, Sheila Simpson, J.A. Shepard, Rob Davis. They're supposed to see Jesus Christ. And I know we talk like that, but we're supposed to be so interconnected just like a married couple. It was so sad to, to do the funeral for Dean and Kathy, but, you know, I, I made, made a brief mention about this the other day as I was doing the funeral. Whenever you talk about Dean, to me, you always had to talk about Dean and Kathy because they were always together. They clean out the gutters and the parsonage, and I still think it was Kathy that he put on the roof, but it was Dean and Kathy that came and did things. Every time I was around them, it was Dean and Kathy doing this, Dean and Kathy, Dean and Kathy. And I'm sure you had, they, they each had their own things they did from time to time, and maybe you worked with them, maybe you saw the separateness of them, but so often it was one, and I thought that was a great example of a marriage that God wanted because without one, you don't have the other. It's both of them together, and that's what God wants. I, I was amazed. I was talking to some couples this last week, and I told them I know of people I, I know of pastors in ministry that would go on vacation and leave their wives at home. Don't understand that at all. How is that to becoming one? And yet, that not that culturally what we do today? Because the problem we have is marriage no longer is what God wanted. In fact, here's what we have, and we need to know for the day. The truth is that marriage is a covenant, not a contract. That's something we... And you say, well, what? What's the difference? There is a huge difference. See... In, in, in this understanding of this whole term here about what's going on, we have to understand that God defined marriage as a covenant. A covenant also includes God in its mix as opposed to a co contract. But so many people today, they sit back and go like, uh, what's the big deal about marriage? In fact, you notice how our society has really put to shame marriage, isn't it? We redefine marriage. In fact, it no longer includes a man and a woman. It includes a man and whoever. A man, another man, a woman, another woman. And, and, and that's not really my subject today, but we address those things. And we go, it's okay, because it's just a piece of paper, isn't it? You're just going down to the justice of peace. You're just standing before some people making it known. In fact, there are people that believe you don't even need to get married in that kind of setting. But the truth is, that's cultural thinking, and that's not godly thinking. See, to God, marriage is a covenant, not a contract. And here's the difference. A contract is based on mutual distrust. Okay? And you got to think with me today. I'm not trying to make it hard, but you've got to think with me here. A contract is based on mutual distrust. Basically, when you sign a contract, and I remember my dad talked to me about when he was a boy, they go down to, to the store and they just shake hands with somebody. He bought his first car um, in town just by shaking hands with a guy. And maybe some of you have that kind of same thing going on, but nowadays you don't do that, do you? In fact, you go to a car dealership. If you go to a car dealership, what happens? You're there. First of all, they don't let you go, but you're there. When you finally do decide on that car, they bring out all these papers. And, and remember the price that you really originally thought it was? 
They bring out all these extra papers that say it's not really that price. We got all these extra hidden things and delivery fees and, you know, all the crazy stuff going in there. And you spend all this time talking about all these things and you're signing here and signing there and sign here and initial this and do that. You do that with everything, don't you? I remember when we bought a house down in Florida. Man, it took like hours. We sat in this lawyer's office, which that should tell you something too about it. Sat in a lawyer's office. Big, huge, thick thing, and we're sitting there, got to sign like every page, initial everything. And I was like, this is going to wear my hand out all day. Do you know why we do that? Because it's a contract, and the contract says, you know what, I don't know you enough. I don't know you enough to trust you. So I want to sign here to show how far I'm willing to go in this relationship, and I want you to sign too, so that we're both in it mutually about the same amount. The contract tells us how far we're willing to go. But it's meant to cover us in case of distrust because when you go back on your word, and unfortunately that's what we do in today's society, when you go back on your word, hmm, I got you because it's in the contract because that contract's all about making sure you keep the trust. So a contract is really based on mutual distrust. The covenant, though, on the other side is based on mutual commitment. It is. That's what God wanted. It's what God termed it to be. It's a mutual uh, understanding of what we're supposed to do. See, we're supposed to be 100%, and that's what you find back in Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, isn't it? When, when the two became one flesh, that's the idea here. I'm all in, you're all in, we're not separate, but we're 100% in at all times. In fact, the word there, covenant, this is pretty interesting, from the Hebrew word, and once again, the, the Hebrew doesn't really matter to you as much, but the word covenant in Hebrew means Cutting. 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 It means uh, a binding agreement or a blood covenant. In fact, throughout the Old Testament, and this is so strange for us, when people made covenants, blood was always involved. Blood was always involved. You go to Genesis chapter 15 where God makes a covenant with Abraham and his, his nation really down the road, but God has them bring all these animals and kill them, and they would take, and this is something that was true, they would take the animals that were cut in half, and sp- after they cu- killed them, they spread them, slid them across, and the two people would walk side by side together through the blood. Through the blood. It was a blood covenant. In fact, marriages... In the original days, back in the Old Testament days, and this is sort of weird, and I know some of you guys are getting married soon. We won't do this. But what they would do is the man and the woman would come. They would take a rope, and they would join their arms together, standing there before the preacher or whoever's doing the ceremony. They would join their arms together with a a rope, and then the the preacher would pull out a long, sharp knife. Uh There's blood involved here. And he would slit the hands of both the groom and the bride, and then he would take the hands and put them together. And he would say the words, what God has joined together, that no man put apart. It was always based on blood. The covenant is a a blood oath. And, and, And yes, we've gone away from that today in our society, but we've gone away from the meaning. Because you think the ultimate covenant was the covenant of the New Testament where Jesus Christ said, I give my blood for you on the cross, and there's the blood that shed so that we could come to know Jesus Christ. The same picture, once again, that we use in marriage really is. There was shedding of blood. But normal isn't normal anymore, is it? That's not how today's society works, is it? Think about it. Today's society is more on the contract, isn't it? And, and, and that's the problem. See, and, and by the way, let me just say this. If you want normal, you can have normal. God didn't call me to be normal, and that's a good thing, because I'm not a normal person. You know, when I walk, what normal is today? You know what normal is today? It's people in relationships that hurt each other, that walk away from each other. I, I've seen shocking stories where men walked out on marriages and women and children. And women have done the same thing. And we're in a painful world full of hurt, and that's become the normal. Turn on the news. Look at what, what hey, you know what the, the great leaders of our country are showing you? They're showing you normal now. And normal's not what God wanted. Because if it's just a paper, if it's just something that I'm, I'm going to hold on to because I know I can't trust you, then I'm not going in very far on this contract. We're going to sign prenuptials. We're going to sign all these different contracts to make sure I get what I get and you only get what you get because we're afraid of each other. 
And normal's gotten so bad now that people, hey, you know what? I, I think this has become the sign. Today, people do married things way before they're even married, right? It's become more common. Move in together, right? Now, hang with me on this one because we're going to talk about this for a minute and the problem with it. People do married things before they're even married. And I hear the excuse, well, we're just checking each other out, make sure we're good, or we love each other so much. And they've bought into the lies of society, culture, and a lot of them I feel sorry for them because they don't know what God's plan is. And that's where we as a church need to do a better job telling what God's plan in a loving way is. But the truth is, we get to this point where people are doing married things and they're not even married, and you know what they do? What do, what do a couple do? They, marry, they, they move in together. Let's get a place together. That's what married couples do, right? And if you get a place, you've got to have stuff in that place, right? So they go out and pick out furniture. They go out and pick out all these different things. They might even go together on a car or whatever. But as things get rough and tough in their marriage, what happens? They decide, hey, we're not married, so let's, let's part ways. You say, well, that's cool. They didn't get married, so they didn't get divorced, right? They may not have been divorced in a court, but you know what? They still practice divorce, don't they? Because when they split up, they look at each other and go, well, who gets the table? And who gets the sofa? And who gets the TV? And who gets the bed? And, who gets... and they go through that. And they practice that over and over again. And you'll find a younger generation today that's going out practicing marriage, practicing divorce, practicing marriage, practicing divorce. And then eventually they do. They find the, their one. Remember, they, they were looking for the one, but it's the wrong one. They should have been looking for their two. Well, that was week one if you didn't understand that. So go back to week one and watch that one. What happens during this period, they get so involved because they found their one, their knight in shining armor, or their princess that they're rescuing, and they get married thinking that's going to solve everything, right? But they're still based on everything they know. And so they get married in a couple years into it. Remember, three, every, uh, within three years, 50% of all marriages end in divorce, right? What happens? The first time they have problems in their marriage, what do they do? They do what they've been practicing all their lives. They practice marriage, so what, do they, what else do they practice? They practice divorce, and so divorce comes. And so we have pain, we have suffering, and that's not what God's plan was. That's not at all what God's plan is. See, God's plan was not to practice marriage, not to practice divorce, but God said, hey, you know what? Be one, let's be united, let's become one flesh. And when we stand there and say those vows that so many people want to change now and they don't want those traditional vows in their way anymore because they don't like them, that sounds too much like God and the Bible, they come up with all these kind of other crazy things. But you know what? The truth of the matter is still what God wanted was for us to love each other in sickness and in health. For richer, or in my case, I told my wife, for poor. And it was till death. Till death do we part. And that was a, not a contract. I didn't make a contract with my wife. I made a covenant based on a mutual commitment. And that's the idea here. And when we talk about this, marriage is not about a 50-50 relationship. It's not even 100-100. You know what? It is a mutual covenant that commits to each other. See, <laughs> when we talk about this thing, it's about giving everything I've got and everything my wife's got. It's the model that Jesus gave us that Christ came and said, I love you so much that I'm going to do, do as I do, I'm going to give my whole life. And that's why when you look in the New Testament, Paul says, hey, you know what? Jesus Christ loved the church so much that he died for the church. And we're sitting there going, wait a minute, I thought he just died for me. No, he died for this relationship called the church that we're in. That's the whole idea there. See, we talk about this covenant, this covenant partnership and it's symbolized with two things, and that is godly leadership and mutual submission. And that's where you go to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5, you have your Bibles. We've read this before, but I want you to see this because it's so important. In chapter 5, verse number 21, Paul here has given us so many things to think about. And he's talking about this aspect of living in love. And we talked about that back in week one. But here it is. He's, he's bringing us down to the aspect of the relationship of marriage because he wants to draw out what a church should look like. And he says this in this one verse that we have to stop on and just look at for just a minute. He says, submit. Oh, and right away, like, everybody's like, oh, I don't like that word. And a lot of times men are smiling because you've heard it in church, like, the woman's supposed to submit to the man. No, no. Read what it says. Submit to one another. 
out of reverence for Christ. Mutual submission. Mutual submission. What do you mean? I thought I was ahead. No, you're sub submitting just like Jesus submits to his Father, just like the church should submit to Jesus Christ. We are to submit to one another. Because way back in Genesis, remember I pointed this out as we started, what was God looking out for man when he created woman? He wasn't looking for someone to serve man. He wasn't looking for someone to cook his meals and wash his clothes and, and do all the chores that he had for her. That's where we came in with sin and tainted that. You know what he was doing? He said, I want someone who will help complete man, who will make an even even exchange in this relationship, someone that they will be so united that they'll become one. Not two, but one. Not separate vacations, not separate ideals, not separate visions, but one. And he says it pretty clear here. In fact, verse 21 is the lead-in to all the rest of the verses that are going to follow. He says, submit to one another. Submit to one another. And then he goes on and says, let me make sure we understand what this submission is going to look like. And he says in verse 22 through 24, he says, wives. Wives. Equals. Half of the partner relationship of the covenant. Wives. Submit yourselves to your own husbands. Not to somebody else's husband. Not to any other person. Submit only to your husband as you do to the Lord. And that's so important there that we miss that so often. He's talking about partner with your husband. Don't get, get hooked up with somebody else. Don't fall in love with somebody else. and Don't serve someone else. Serve God and serve your spouse. That's what he says. And then he says in verse 23, he says, For the husband, and this is the reason, for the husband is the head of the wife. And if we stop there, it would be a problem because we'd take it out of context what he's saying. But he wants to make sure we get the whole image here. He says, the husband's the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. And why did he have to say that for us? Because we think, hey, I'm the head. Hey, I'm the head. <laughs> Serve me, woman. And we treat women like their possessions, like they don't have a life, that they don't have any kind of real existence other than to serve me. And you know what? The word wasn't serve, it was submit. Did you hear that? And the example wasn't a dictator. The example was Jesus. The example was John chapter 13, when Jesus is sitting there before his disciples, and they, no one has, has done the chore of the slave in the room. No one has washed those nasty, dirty feet. And Jesus pops up from the dinner table, actually the dinner carpet on the floor, and he gets up and he walks over and he takes off his outer robe because it could get dirty and he puts a towel around his waist and he fills a basin full of water and he starts washing one nasty foot after another and there's nothing more disgusting than feet. It's true. And he gets done, he takes that towel off and disposes of the water in the basin and they're all sitting there just shocked because Jesus, the rabbi, the teacher, the son of God, had taught him this and he looks at him and he says, if I, your master, if I, your master, can do this, go out and serve one another. Do likewise. And then he tells us, blessed or happy, happy is the one who does this. We get down a few more verses and he says, I give you a new command. If you're my disciples, you're supposed to show love one for another. That's the picture here of, John, of Ephesians 5.23. That's the head, guys. The head saying, you know what? If things need to get done, I don't put it on my wife. I put it on me. That's the head saying, hey, you know what? She should submit to me as equals so I can serve her. Because when you get married, you're not about you. It's about serving the other person, meeting their needs, meeting their desires. In verse 24, he goes and says, now as the church, and he's continuing his whole thought, now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands and everything. And he gives them a picture. Uh, we've already given you the picture of the man, but he wants to make sure that wives get their part too. And he says, wives, your picture is just like the church. That is the real church of Jesus Christ that was growing and serving and things like that. And he says, you know what? Hey, wives, you're supposed to submit to do the things that Jesus needs done out of love for him. See, we don't serve Jesus. If you came today because you had to come, you shouldn't come anymore. Did the preacher just say that? Yeah, he did. 
Jesus doesn't want you here because you had to be here. Jesus wants you here because you love to be here. Jesus wants you in Bible studies, not because you had to, not because somebody made you feel guilty for not coming, not because of all those other things. He wants you to serve because you love him. He wants you to tell the good news of Jesus Christ to the world because you love him. That's the truth that we miss. That's the submission. The church should submit to the will of Jesus Christ. And he doesn't hoard it over us. Jesus doesn't come in with a big stick going, all right, give me your tithe. No, that's not it at all. Jesus says, I want to serve you and love you and help you to the point where you love me back so much that we're one. And that's the image we get. See, men, our job in this, obviously we just talk about godly leadership. We see Christ submitting himself. He laid out his life and, and he calls us to live submitted and surrendered lives as Christ followers. That's the whole idea here. And that's what marriage should be. Surrender to the other person. Submit to the other person. Not being slaves, not being doormats. That's what we're talking about. And it's mutual submission. See, the heart of Christ was that of a servant leader. And the Bible tell, tells us that he laid down his life. And that's what we're supposed to do, men. We're supposed to be willing to lay down our life. Every day, not just when somebody's doing something mean to us. Every day, we should be sacrificing our life for our wives. And that's where I hurt myself because I know I don't live up to that standard. See, as leaders, guys, we're not supposed to be dictators. We're not supposed to be demanding of what time dinner is going to be on the table or any of those other things. You know what we're supposed to be? We're supposed to be the ones who set the tone for our marriage. Adam failed in this event, and this is why we're all sinful. This is, this is the problem, and, and we point out this problem because Adam was the failed Adam, but the second Adam who came from above, Jesus Christ, led us in the right way. He walked the path of Calvary, didn't he? We're supposed to set the tone, set the direction, set the values for our family. Not by dictatorship, but by leading in the right way. <laughs> hey, you know what, guys? If you want your wife to honor and respect you, you know what you need to do? You need to give her something to honor and respect. Not coming to church doesn't help. Not being the leader in the family spiritually doesn't help. There's a huge epidemic in America, American Christianity where ladies are taking the lead, and, and I'm, I'm not berating them at all in this. They're taking the lead because men haven't. I don't want that to happen in Maple Springs, guys. We need to do what we're supposed to do, not because we're dominant, not because we're men, but because we've been called by Christ to do this thing. And we love our ladies enough that we will lead in the way God's called us to. That's the Bible way. See, the problem is so often in these, in these problems where the men aren't laying out the vision for their home, you, marry, you, you couples are getting ready to get married. You know what? You guys need to lay out the vision for your marriage. You do. <laughs> you want a marriage that's going to succeed? Lay out the vision for your marriage. The problem is in this day, in this culture, we teach, hey, everybody ought to have their own little vision for marriage. And you know what happens? Two, what do we call two visions? Division. That's what two, two visions are called. Division. Leads to divorce. And that's the problem. See, the truth is, your marriage, and, the, and that's true, I don't care how long you've been married here in this room or, or how short you've been married, your marriage will be as good as both of you choose it to be. You know that? That's the truth here. Your marriage will be as good as you both decide it will be. And, it, it, and, and when you decide, make sure you're deciding on God's plan here. See, you're going to sit back and say, well, there'll be times I don't feel like it's good. I understand that. There'll be times when you don't feel like being nice. There'll be times when you don't feel like forgiving the other person. There'll be times when you don't feel like going to your work, having uh, working hard. There'll be times like that. But let me ask you this. How many other areas of your life can you use not feeling like it to get out of doing it? other than marriage, because that's why a lot of people divorce. I didn't feel like it was good. I didn't feel like putting in the effort. Can't do that with your job. Can't do that with your mortgage payments. Can't do that with your car payments, can you? No, not at all. See, the truth is marriage isn't measured by your feelings. <laughs> and that's where we've gotten in today's society. We talk about, I don't feel like a man, I don't feel like a woman, so we have all kinds of different... I, I didn't know there were other genders other than man and woman. It, it's con 
And do you get where we're, 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 a, we're a, a culture that's being led by our feelings, and our feelings are driving us off the cliff of God's word? And judgment is coming, and I know nobody likes to hear that, but that's the truth. Your marriage isn't measured by your feelings. You know what? There are days that I'm sure my wife doesn't feel like being married to me. But you know what? I have never doubted that my wife loves me and is married to me. Never. Because marriage is measured by commitment, not feelings. And that's the truth. <sighs> feelings will follow commitment, and that's the whole idea. And you say, well, I'm not happy. <laughs> we fell out of love. You know what I say to that? And listen careful on this one. When people tell me that they've fallen out of love, <clears throat> I usually tell them this. Getting divorced because you ran out of love is like selling a car because you ran out of gas. Isn't that silly? Sure is. Hey, you know what? Love is not a feeling. It's a choice. It is. And, and once again, I'm trying to be sensitive here. I understand there are people that are hurting because they, they had to go through some tough things in their life. But let me just say this. I know this, that when I'm in the right place with God, and when my wife's in the right place with God, we can be united as one flesh, and that marriage is a marriage of honor God. But the problem is, are we willing to be united or untied? Take a look at these two words, united or untied. You know the difference between these two words is this one letter and where it's at, the letter I. It's all about where the I is. See, if the I is in the right place, my marriage is going to be united. But if the I is in the wrong place, my marriage is untied. And that's not what we want, which leads us to the third vow, the vow of partnership. I promise our marriage will, <clears throat> will be about we and not me. Everybody say that with me. I promise our marriage will be about we and not me. God didn't call you into a contract. He called you into a covenant. A covenant. And that covenant was going to cost somebody blood, and that cost Jesus Christ's blood. And hear me today very carefully. If you're here or you're listening online and you don't know Jesus Christ, your Savior, the truth of the matter is there's nobody in this room that's any good. There are so many bad things about me, and you know what I deserve? I deserve to spend the rest of eternity burning in hell's eternal fl flames. That's what I deserve. And the truth is, that's what you deserve too. But Jesus Christ loved me and led me to the place where I have hope because he walked down a road, a path that led him to Calvary. Jesus Christ died on the cross and there he faced the wrath of God for my sins, for everything I've done in the past, the present, and the future. He was the sacrifice. He said, you know what? I'm making a covenant with you. All you have to do is accept that. He did all the work. There's nothing you have to do other than take the free gift of salvation. But it's so easy that people look at it and go, no way. And we hold on to our old ways of doing things. We hold on to our old contracts we say, you know what, I'm not sure I can trust God. I'm not sure I can trust my fellow man. I'm not sure I'm going to do those things. And we fall out of love. We fall out, of, fall out of all those things, which is silly because you can't. Because the Bible tells me that God so loved the world that he kept giving and giving and giving, gave his only begotten son, the greatest gift ever. But a gift only does good if you accept that gift. So if you're here today listening or you're, you're watching online, and you don't know Jesus Christ, your personal Savior. That's the ultimate gift. That's the ultimate reward. That's the ultimate uh, solution to our sin problem. Other, everything else is a waste of time in life. They say that life is about whoever has the most toys, dies with the most toys, wins. I tell you, it's whoever dies with the best relationship with God. That's the truth behind it. And yet we still follow after our own lusts. We follow after our own desires. Today, what I'm offering you is a chance to make good on a promise for eternal life. Jesus Christ 
died for you. And if you haven't accepted Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, I'm not asking, are you a church member? I'm not asking if you've been baptized. I'm not asking if you've, you've given to our church. Um, I'm not asking if you've done any other religious thing. I'm not asking if you're a Baptist, a Methodist, a Presbyterian, a Catholic, or anything else. The Bible says there's only one way, and that's a relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ said it himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. So if you don't know Jesus Christ today, if you've never accepted him as your personal Savior, today's the day. Come forward during the invitation. I'm here, Tracy's here. There's other people that we can show you from God's word how you can know without any doubt that Jesus Christ died for you and you are going to spend eternity with him. That's the truth. Obviously, this message was about marriage. So how is it? Guys, are you leading in your marriage? Are you submitting to your wife? Your wives, are you submitting to your husband? Do you have two visions for your marriage? Instead of one, that'll be division. I've encouraged you throughout this whole series today once again during the invitation if you're a Christ follower I want you to pray for those who may not be Christ followers during the invitation but I also want you to do this I want you to reach over to the, the, the wife you have if she's here with you or the husband's here with, with you here I want you to put your arm around them and while you can do it right where your seats you, if you want to you can come down to the altar but I want you to do it today I want you to get serious and while we're sitting here I want you to promise to your spouse that it'll be about we and not me by praying with them. A silent prayer, just whisper to the other person. Pray that God would bless you in your pursuit of him first, your spouse second, and that you would commit to the priority of marriage. Ask God that he would help you in your pursuit of the other person. And then thirdly, ask that he would make it a partnership with him. Some of you guys have gotten married and you never asked God to be a part of your marriage. Some of you guys did that. And today I, what I want you to do is I want you to reach over to the other person and say, hey, let me pray with you real quick and ask God to come in and be a part of your marriage. And I want the guys to take the lead and do this. This is the invitation today. Won't you do what God's asking you to do and commit to a good marriage? I'm tired of seeing marriages fail. I'm tired of seeing the pain of wreck of marriages. Those people here in this room that have gone through divorce, you know what they tell you? It hurts. It hurts so much. That's not what God wants for you. And they don't want you to go through what they've had to go through either. Why don't you do something that God wants this day? God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your power. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. So God, right now, I pray that you just help us at this time of invitation. I pray you'd help men to step up and be men who would lead. Lead. Some of these men have never led in their lives in their marriage. Their wives have been the, the more spiritually concerned person. So God, God, I pray that their husbands today would, would take the lead and, and do what I've asked them to do, to, to ask for prayer for their marriage, to ask you into their marriage, the Holy Spirit to be strong in it. God, I pray that you just help us as we think about our marriages, but even more so, God, if your Holy Spirit's here in our lives convicting someone of sin, someone of their failures to know you, God, today, I pray that it would be the day that they walk down this aisle and they would get it right with you, that they would accept you as their Savior, their Lord, their King. We ask for your divine hand in today's invitation. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand. We're going to sing up here. You don't need to. You know what, guys, you need to do. Time's now. Won't you do what God wants you to do as we sing? You are my strength when I am weak. You are the treasure that I see. You are my all in all. I'm seeking you as a precious jewel. 
Lord, to give up, I'd be a fool. You are my all in all. Taking my sin, my cross, my shame, rising again, I bless your name. You are my all. over again please as the chorus plays on and they sing I want all the men to come forward let me have all the men come forward come right down here to the middle here gather real close come in real tight guys real tight guys real tight real tight get in a tight group where you can touch everybody that's what I want you to do get tight yeah we're not showing you off. No, get, get tight, like a circle, guys. So, yeah, right in front of each other. There you go. Get real tight. I want you to put your hand on the shoulder of the guy next to you. Let me pray for you, guys, as they sing. They sing. Guys, God, we ask that uh, you give our men a divine blessing here. I pray for the health and, and welfare of their marriages, their relationships. God, I pray more than anything that you would help these men to be men. Help these men to take the lead in their, their church, in their families, not to be dictators or dominators, but to love in a way that Jesus loved. That their wives would, would flourish in the relationships of their marriages because, well, you helped them, showed them the way by leading your church by dying on the cross for our sins. So God, I pray that every man here, as they've been uh, faithful to come up here, God, I pray that you just help them, even ones who aren't even married, that you would help them down the road to love their wives the way you love the church, the way you loved us and died for us. God, I pray that you'd help us, help us to, to be strong and to, to, to be protectors, but to be leaders spiritually. Help us to put... Our, our own passions aside, our own desires. Help us not to focus on the stuff of life. Help us not to focus on the things that take away our jobs and, and, and all those things, but help us to focus on our wives. Help us to pursue the priority of them, but by pursuing the priority of a relationship with you. God, help us to, to, to put that pursuit into action and then partner with them. Help us to be complimenting them in the way that they are striving to, 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 to be with you. So God, today, help us. Help us, as we reflect you to the society, help us to be good men of God, good husbands, good leaders in our church. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, guys. Tracy. The vow. Uh, we've been going through this sermon series. And again, if you haven't called every one of them or if you want to go back to any of them, Please make sure you go to the website and, uh, and see it there. But today, the, the vow of partnership, I'll be honest with you, uh, uh, I find it kind of cool. Uh, actually, we're going through this sermon series, and then we're also, uh, Bill has mentioned it, uh, uh, Bill and myself are, are in the middle of marriage counseling uh, with some young folks. Uh, and and I, I can't lie, what I heard today, uh, uh, Hannah and Grayson, Sounds like I need to go get a knife, a nice new knife. Uh, we're gonna make a blood oath, uh, but no. Uh, what a what a series that we've been in, and it continues next week again as well. Uh, the vow, the vow of purity, uh, for next week. So I encourage you to be here for that as well. Uh, but I do have a few announcements uh, to make. Uh, 
uh, first of all, I do want to make mention next Saturday afternoon, uh, the funeral for, uh, for our brother Steve uh, is going to be here. Uh, the viewing is 1245 to 145, and the service actually starts at 2 o'clock, so I encourage you to come out uh, and, and support the family. Uh, be with them, uh, pray with them, uh, but just be there for them. Uh, again, that's next Saturday, so make sure you have that. Also, uh, the women's ministry, uh, I think Ms. Sandra has pushed back the, the beginning of the Bible study. Uh, to be quite honest with you, if you want any information or anything about the women's ministry, please see Sandra before you leave today. I, I, I can't begin to remember everything, so please see Ms. Sandra. And guys, if there's any questions that you have as far as men's ministry, uh, Brother Bob, as you walk out, he's standing outside. Uh, hook up with him, and they can tell you some of the ins and outs, some of the different ministries, some of the different opportunities uh, that are coming up in the near future. I do want to step back and thank uh, some of the folks that, that came out Friday afternoon, uh, especially the ones that were behind the scene that we don't get to see, uh, the ones that helped out with the funeral and everything Friday, whether it was in the parking lot or was uh, with the family down in the fellowship hall. Uh, I want to appreciate, I appreciate the people that are behind the scenes all too often helping out with those. I, I appreciate you so much for that. Uh, I do want to mention, uh, as far as our, uh, if you don't have a prayer guide, by the way, make sure you grab one as you walk out. There's still a few more back there, but grab a hold of that prayer guide and, and use that as your prayer guide as you go through the coming weeks. Uh, that way you can write it down. If I don't write it down, I don't remember it. So I have to write them down. Write those prayers down uh, on paper. Write those, those praise reports down on paper. Uh, so as you go to your quiet time each and every day, you have that in front of you. Uh, also, don't forget, you can use the website, not to only go back for the, the sermon series that, that we're in or the ones that we've already went through, but also that is the best place to go to get the prayer request and the praise reports in front of your family, in front of your church. Uh, and then uh, you can also go to the Facebook family page as well. Uh, or if all else fails, jot it down on a piece of paper, drop it in the offering uh, plate as, as you leave today. But I would ask that you continue to, to pray for the, the Richardson family. And as well uh, for, uh, for Kathy uh, and that family as well as they walk through this time of, of loss in their lives. Uh, pray for them. Uh, pray for, for them as they step through this time. As we finish up today, we finish up with our offers and tithes, our celebration of our offers and tithes. And uh, uh, we had a discussion this morning in, in our small group time uh, about faith. Uh, and the conversation led itself into uh, what do we actually put faith in? Uh, the different stuff that we actually put faith in. And not just God, but the different stuff. And so I asked, uh, I, I, it started running around my brain as we were sitting in there, how much faith do we actually put in money? Uh, uh, you know, as we finish each and every service with our offerings and our tithes, our celebration of those times, you know, we need to also thank the worth of what we offer the worth of our ties. I find it unique that the, the times that I've uh, traveled uh, to mission fields and, and out of the United States, how, how the worth of the dollar dramatically, I brought back to Ben a whole handful of, of cash and coins from Honduras. Uh, and when we got here, he's, he thought he was rich. I was like, no, son, uh, it's, it, it's not worth a whole lot. Uh, but the question that I have for you is how much is your giving and your and your gifts worth. I have a piece of scripture that I actually used in a small group this morning when we were talking about this. It's actually out of James, James chapter 1, uh, verse 17. It says, every good and perfect gift is from above. It's from above. Our, our gifts, that's what our gifts are worth. It's, it's that every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly light, who does not change like the shifting shadows. What that reminds me of is, is yeah, the dollar bill... <laughs> It might not be worth the same as it was once, but what the dollar bill is worth, it's, it's worth what God says it's worth. All of our possessions, all of our, no matter what kind of, what your bank account looks like, no matter what your vehicle looks like, no matter what your house looks like, your worth is because of Him. It's His anyway. With that said, let's end in a word of prayer today, and, and we'll see you again tonight. Father, we thank you for today. Father, we thank you for... Father, first of all, I, I, I thank you for my worth, dear Lord. Father, it, were, it was worth so much to you that you went to the cross. Father, I thank you for that. 
And Father, as, as we've been going through the sermon series on, on the vow, Father, we need to make it important in our lives, dear Lord. That vow is that important. Because you said it's that important. Father, we thank you for that. Father, we thank you for uh, this sermon series that we've been able to walk through with, with Brother Bill. Father, we thank you for this message. Father, we thank you for, Father, I thank you for this church. Father, what these people mean to me, but Father, what we mean to each other. Father, we thank you for that work. Father, we thank you for, for the steps that we're going to take as we leave out today, Father. No matter where those steps lead us, dear Lord, Father, I ask that you lead us and guide us. And Father, I ask that you lead us and guide us as we, as we even walk out today, as we celebrate with our offerings and tithes today, Father. We, we, we just want to thank you for it all, dear Lord. Father, we thank you for everything because every good thing that we have in our life is because of you. Father, we thank you and we love you, Father. And we ask all this in Christ's precious and most powerful name. Amen.